So yeah, two big issues. I, I entitled the message the Abrahamic Covenant, which is uh, very, uh, very important. Of course, the, the promise to Abraham, we've already seen it uh, several times. It's been mentioned. But at the same time, uh, this becomes uh, uh, an issue that involves Abraham's faith. And literally, as the New Testament writers say, in a sense, his saving faith, he becomes the example of having righteousness given, accredited, imputed to him simply because of his faith uh, in God's promises. Uh, Hal Lindsey, a number of years ago, wrote a, a very uh, interesting book on, um, on, on the Jewish people and this idea of the Abrahamic covenant. And he says, from the 12th chapter of Genesis onward, the rest of the biblical message is related to four unconditional covenants which God made with Abraham and his descendants, Sir Ike and, uh, Isaac and Jacob. Not only Israel's destiny, but indeed the destiny of the whole world is secured by these covenants. And then here's kind of the bottom line. Without an understanding of these covenants, it's impossible to know what the Bible is all about. And uh, so important that we uh, understand. So we'll spend a little time with that. That's certainly a big issue. Saving by faith alone that we see here in this issue of God's promise to, uh, uh, to Abraham and his physical descendants. But again, the context is we saw last week Lot, his nephew, gets captured when the king of Iraq, Iran, and two kings from uh, Turkey uh, invade what we call the kings of the Dead Sea area in the south. Uh, and basically, they weren't paying their tribute. They come in, talked about some of the strategy of, uh, of the battle that ensued. Uh, Abraham hears about it. He jumps in with his 318 guys that are specially trained for this type of uh, warfare and operation. They head off and... Uh, and basically make it through the night, uh, arrive at night after uh, getting, uh, uh, whether they were on camels, on foot, we don't know, but they arrive uh, about 120 miles, catch these guys in the night. And the writer of Hebrews then says, and slaughtered the kings of the north, uh, uh, and uh, Lot and everybody is rescued. That, that's the context we were last week. Verse 1 al almost should go in that context, because now Abraham's back, and he's worried about retaliation, you know, coming against him. Uh, and so that's on his mind. That's in verse 1. But then that ensues as God reiterates, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. He says, what about that child thing? You know, because uh, the promise is made to him and Sarah. At the beginning, they would have a son through him, many descendants. Through one of them, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. They're 10 years waiting. So he now is 85. She's now 75. He's getting a little bit of concern. This is kind of a contemporary tale. a little reality of Abraham and Sarah so that we understand when God takes him outside and reiterates his promise. And basically, he's, he's going to say to God, Amen, God. That's literally, in a sense, what it says in, in Hebrew. In Hebrew, he's, it says, Abraham says, It is so when God says that to him. It's, a, it's in a pretty astounding uh, statement and, and certainly important for us in regards to our own salvation. Well, let's look at the first six verses. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring indeed. One born in my house is, uh, is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, The one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So, there's the promise of protection that I mentioned because the concern about retaliation. And of, uh, of course, if, uh, you know, that's always the, uh, always the case, even if you're in that playground fight, you're always concerned about that guy's big brother. You know, I, I always felt like it was always to almost win the fight. See, if you almost win the fight, then other guys look, well, you know, he didn't win, but I wouldn't want to fight with him. Uh, and, if you, and by not winning, you don't have to worry about a retaliation. So it's actually better to almost win that playground fight in fifth grade. But anyway, that's just a little advice. The, uh, but there, the concern, of course, is these are nations that have been defeated. And there's a lot of folks back home. He's, a, he's certainly rightly concerned. But God comes to him with this uh, wonderful promise. I am thy shield, thy exceedingly 
great reward. And what God is asking Abraham to do at this point in this ensuing promise is certainly to exhibit faith or put trust in him. And there's times when our own life, when God asks us to do the same, where the, where the promises of God are stated over here and the circumstances of my life are over here and there's a big gap in between, like the guy we saw in the DVD clip. And what we fill that gap is with faith, but that faith is meant to be based on tied directly to the integrity of God because uh, he is trustworthy. And it's one of the reasons that we, we study God's word so we can see his character. We study the gospels to see who God really is through the person of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and is, this is exactly what they were able to do. I may not know everything. I may not know what's going on. I can't see the end from the beginning right now, but I know I can trust the integrity of God. In Hebrews 11, 11, and I kind of dropped this in my notes later. I, I don't have a PowerPoint slide for you, but it's talking about Sarah and her great faith. And in a sense, this is exactly what it says uh, of the same context. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Uh, that's what she does. I'm not really sure how this is going to happen since I'm past age, but I'm going to believe the promise because I know that God is faithful. Uh, think of the limitations. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit in them. They really didn't have the resources we had, uh, and things weren't looking too good at this point. Uh, but at the same time, God is delaying. He's doing it for a purpose, as he does with us sometimes, and he asks us to trust him. The second thing we see here is the promise includes a son from your own body. Uh, when it says the word of the Lord came, uh, again, first mention of that phrase more than 100 times in the Old Testament. And uh, also, again, the context is he's saying, Eliezer is my servant. That's my only heir right now. He's getting everything unless something comes along. Lot is gone. I don't have any nieces or nephews. My closest relatives are 500 miles away. Uh, we're both getting a bit older and time is running out uh, and God is delaying. And the reason that he's delaying, one of the writers in the New Testament says, is so that he can be assured and everyone else can be assured that their bodies are as good as dead in terms of being able to conceive and have a child. Why? So that when he does it, everybody goes, well, that was the Lord. <laughs> Why does, why does uh, uh, Jesus allow Lazarus to remain four days in the tomb? So that when he calls him forth, everybody knows. Pretty sure that was a miracle. I don't think really dead people do that for four days. Sometimes God in his delays is doing it again for his glory, that people would realize who he is and others would put their trust in him. And that's one of those things that we see here. Abraham is delaying. And it is delayed in the answer so that God would get the glory. And we don't often pray that way, do we? Lord, you know, I'm concerned over this, but I just pray you'll delay answering my prayer as long as you want, you know, because I want you to get the glory. No, we actually were saying right now would be a really good time, Lord, like, like yesterday even. And, and that's the kind of prayer you've got going on here uh, with Abraham. But the amazing thing is that when God says, no, nope, I'm good for my word, Abraham says, I got it. I believe you. I trust you. It's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And then gives them the illustration. Go outside. Look up at the skies. See the stars. Count them in sequence is literally what it says. Count them in sequence if you can uh, and number them. Uh, we're told in a general catalog there's about 30,000 stars that are listed, but there's estimates of 100 billion. It's not saying that he will have descendants that will number in the billions. It's just saying they will be too numerous to count and then the promises received by faith. Again, Genesis 15, 16 is the John 3, 16 of the Bible. We think of one verse that talks about salvation in the Bible. A lot of people say John 3, 16. It's funny. Uh, in the end zones, I don't think they do it anymore at, at football games, although we're going to be looking for it very soon here, won't we? With pre-game started. Uh, it's a sport. Some of you may be aware of it, but it uh, happens this time of year. People looking at me like, football, I... It's a vague memory, but it's coming again soon. And, uh, but in the end zones, people used to hold up big signs. So the camera shot, JN3 colon 16. And everybody knew, oh, hey, John 3, 16. That's, that's what we think about in terms of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now people look at it and go, I wonder what that means. Maybe we should Google it, you know, because they 
most people in our culture don't know. But the equivalent is in the Old Testament. Ken Hughes says about this statement of Abraham in this incident, as Abraham gazed up in the starry vault to the night and contemplated God's promise, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord. He saw the stars, and beyond the stars, the promise, and beyond the promise, God himself. Abram believed with all of his heart that a vast people would come from his own body, and on that silent night, that holy night, he inwardly breathed and likely voiced an audible, Amen, it is so, to God. And God credited his belief to him as righteousness. Whatever translation is used, whether it's credited, reckoned, counted, or imputed, the meaning is the same. Abraham's righteousness was all God's doing. It's not a promise Abraham makes to God. It's a promise that God makes to uh, Abraham. And there's three key words here. Believe, counted, and righteousness. Abraham believed God, which literally, again, means that he, he probably audibly said, uh, it is so. Uh, the Hebrew word transla translated believe means to lean your whole weight upon. And so Abraham literally was leaning everything he had upon the promise of God and God's promise to him. Again, we're not saved by making promises to God, but by believing his promises to us. The word believe uh, in John's gospel, which tells us about salvation, uh, is used over a hundred times uh, and we see this first very important statement because, again, the New Testament writers, when they're trying to explain that we're saved by grace through faith, is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not that of work so that no one can boast. The illustration is always back to Abraham and this incident here. Secondly, the word there, righteousness. Well, it's our greatest need because, as the Bible tells us, all have sinned. Come sure to the glory of God. Not enough to be religious. God demands perfection. Without perfection, we'll never see the Lord. And so God takes our faith, as little as it is. Jesus says that uh, faith as small as a mustard seed can move a mountain. It's not how great our faith is. It's who our faith is in. In this case, it's in God Almighty. And simply by placing our faith in him, he imputes or credits or give to us his righteousness. And, uh, you know, in the, uh, the conference that we went through during the day, we went through Galatians, which was a big issue at that time. Because basically you had, uh, you know, Jewish believers, which the early church was primarily made of. All the early leaders, of course, were, were Jewish. You had priests as well as Pharisees coming to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Do you think those guys might have had a little bent towards legalism for some reason? Just a little bit? And, uh, uh, and they're all in the church. And then you've got Paul out preaching to all of the goyim, all the Gentiles, and they're getting saved uh, in the same way. And I've used the illustration before, but it's like if you've ever been standing in that line uh, in an airport or someplace where it's very long and you're patiently waiting and the air conditioning has gone out and it's only 99 degrees I've actually, I'm painting a picture of what I've actually done. And that line is like, it looks like as long as a football field, you're, you're like an hour and a half getting up to the front of this thing. Real fast computers running up there somewhere. And you finally get up there and you're almost ready to close in and then a whole group of people rush and cut in line in front of you. You just say, well, praise the Lord. I hope I think, no, you're a little, you're a little upset. And uh, at least I was on that occasion. But it um, doesn't do you any good if the country you're in is India and they're all Indian. You, you can't, it doesn't really help you much to say anything. You just kind of go, Lord, help me make this flight. And uh, you kind of hang in there. Well, it's like that for the Jews. They were in line as well, waiting for the Messiah. Long line. How long? 2,000 years. That's a pretty long line. Now, and now he finally comes and all these Gentile guys come and cut in the line. They're like, wait, wait, in, in the back of the line. <laughs> Go through the baptism, get circumcised. You got a long ways in this line before you get up here. Get out of the line. It was a big issue. This idea of being saved by faith in faith alone. And Paul is constantly having to defend it. That's why he writes Galatians. That's why he lays out what we call the constitution of our faith in Romans. Try to explain all of this once again. That God will actually give, impute, credit, righteousness. As though you and I were perfect before him simply because of our faith in him. And it's, um, it's a wonderful thing, but it's also a thing 
that our flesh really struggles with. Are you sure? <laughs> are you sure that's really true? You really sure that I have a right standing before God? And the New Testament writer says, yeah, we're sure. Look at Abraham. And it always goes back to him in this passage. He believed, put his whole faith in God. Uh, it's a righteous standing. And then the word impute means to put to one's account. It's actually an accounting term. Uh, and that's what we see happen. That's what Isaiah the prophet uh, predicted would happen. The punishment that was upon him brought us peace. Uh, the prophet says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians that uh, uh, he that had no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He takes our sins upon him. We are imputed or given a righteous standing before God. It's a free gift. It's what, we, it's what God gives to us. It's just a, a, an incredible thing. Secondly, the ceremony itself confirms the covenant. That's in verse 7 to 11. If you haven't read it before, well, it's kind of a little interesting little ceremony here. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? He said to, so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. And he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Very interesting Old Testament little ceremonial. I'm kind of good with baptism here. What do you think? This would be kind of strange. Everybody receives the Lord. Well, we're going to have this little ceremony. It's a little different, but no. Uh, but what God does is condescends down to Abram's Understanding. If you were to enter into an agreement in Abram's day, living back there in Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, and uh, you were going to make an agreement of some kind, like maybe a contract that we do today, but obviously a covenant is much more serious, you would do a ceremony like this. The number of animals, the expense of the animals, uh, the largeness of the animals would indicate how important the agreement is, and obviously this is a very important one. The animals really would be cut in two. They would be separated. Each party would walk down the middle and come out the other side and basically look back at the bloody carcasses behind them and say, if I break my agreement, that's what should happen to me. Pretty serious agreement here, wouldn't it? If we did this today, we could probably dispel with a lot of lawyers. But maybe, maybe not. But uh, very serious agreement. The idea, more than a contract, we gave a definition of a covenant a couple of weeks ago, uh, but it all has to do with the land. We talk about how important Israel is, Jerusalem is, and all the way down to this little area called the Temple Mount, uh, where literally animals like this would all be part of the sacrificial system a few hundred years, several hundred years after this, continues to be obviously a big deal in our, our day as well. Is the land Israel's or not? According to the United Nations, it's not, even though they gave it to them in 1948. According to uh, our liberal media sometimes, it's interesting how much they want to take away. And of course, our current president <laughs> mentioned in a speech that uh, they should give even a lot more of it away in order to have peace in the Middle East. And the Isra Isra Israelis would love to have peace. And actually, they are quite willing to give some of it away if they really could have secure borders and have peace. We have no idea what they've gone through, what they have lived under uh, since they became a nation in 1948. Uh, again, our prophecy conference coming up is entitled Israel Under Attack. Well, that's pretty appropriate because they had 100 rockets shot at them last week, one of them killing a man uh, landing on his home in that southern area of Staroth, just above the, the Gaza Strip. Uh, and that was after the IDF uh, retaliated uh, with some uh, airstrike into known Hamas targets in, in Gaza. That was because uh, there was other Hamas terrorists that uh, hijacked and jumped uh, a tourist bus coming uh, filled with uh, Israelis coming out of Egypt, uh, opened uh, automatic fire. Uh, they had a, a little uh, improvised uh, explosion set off just so when the IDF soldiers would show up in the rescue, they could take out a few of them. Three-pronged, very... Uh, thought out attack, killing several Israelis. Israel is really under attack. In the north, you've got uh, Nasrallah, uh, who's uh, the head of Haz, uh, 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 Haz, Haz, <laughs> I'm sorry, spacing out on it now. 
Hezbollah. Hezbollah. But if they say Hezbollah, they really pronounce the, you know, uh, so you know who, who the, whose side they're fighting on there. Uh, and he's been smuggling uh, weapons as fast as they can out of Syria uh, because they're afraid that, uh, that Syria is going to fall and they may not be able to benefit like they have in the past. But that's okay because Turkey just signed an agreement with Iran, so now they can run weapons through Turkey and get them down into uh, southern Lebanon and into uh, Syria and other places for that next war they're about ready to rage. What is this all about? It's about this. God promises the land to Abraham and his physical descendants here, uh, and there's been a lot of fighting over the years because of it. 1932, G. Campbell Morgan wrote this. I, I read this just to say that uh, uh, I love this guy's writing. He's a great British preacher uh, in his day, have a number of his commentaries. I was kind of shocked when I read it. That's why I want to read it. Because uh, of this idea that whose land is it? Uh, God's promising it here. He's cutting a covenant, saying nothing's dependent upon Abram. This is my promise. It's grounded in my integrity. Uh, and yet, 1932, even a great preacher with great theology like G. Campbell Morgan said, I am now quite convinced that the teaching of Scripture as a whole is that there is no future for Israel as an earthly people at all. And yet, uh, I'm sure he might have changed his theology on May 14, 1948, <laughs> when, as Isaiah the prophet said, would happen, Israel would become a nation in a day by the declaration of the United Nations. But here's the promise in the land and reiterated in this incredible ceremony. Well, God responds with a ceremony again, ensuring the covenant. And um, uh, very interesting how they enter into this. Now, the one thing that is different here than Abraham would have been used to is that, well, Abraham never walks through. He tells them, God tells him, you prepare it. And we're going to see in our text, God comes down in a manifestation of this glowing fire and he walks through it and says, I'm the only one obligated to keep it. It's not up to you. It's not up to Abraham. And if your descendants will walk with me the way they should, if they recognize the Messiah the way they should, if they do all the things that I want them to do, then the land is, no, it's not that at all. God simply obligates himself to the promise. Uh, and that's why we say the Bible declares the land is Israel's today. Again, God condescending to do this. Uh, Kyle and Delitz writes, the preceding corresponding rather to the custom prevalent in many ancient nations of slaughtering animals when concluding a covenant. And after dividing them into pieces, of laying the pieces opposite to one another, that the person making the covenant might pass between them. Thus God condescended to follow the custom of the Chaldeans, that he might in the most solemn manner confirm his oath to Abram, the Chaldean. And uh, Abram certainly would have expected to get up and walk through, but God doesn't allow him. He obligates himself only. That's why when we talk about the Abrahamic covenant, this deal, again, not just the land, but I'll bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. Your seed will come from your body. Your, your descendants will be as numerous as the sand on the, on the ground and the stars in the sky. And through one of them, the seed, the Messiah would come and he would be a blessing to, uh, to all of the world. And that's the, the blessing that we have in, in knowing Jesus. Uh, looks like now the covenant includes a prophecy in the middle of all of this is uh, Abraham has prepped everything and waiting for it all to happen. Verse 12, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So uh, very interesting prophecy given in the middle of this uh, covenant ceremony. There's uh, eight parts to it. Uh, and of course, obviously, we know the end of the story. Abraham doesn't. This is all fulfilled through the uh, Egyptian uh, captivity there for 400 years. But notice th uh, the descendants will be strangers in a land not their own. Jacob goes to uh, Egypt following Joseph, uh, Exodus 46. But of course, excuse me, Genesis 46. But in Exodus 1, 
One of the first lines there, my paraphrase is, then the Pharaoh knew not Joseph. In other words, uh, power, power changes hands there. Joseph is uh, gone off the scene. He's no longer the prime minister. And now the Jewish people uh, there become slaves uh, in Egypt. Secondly, God is telling Abraham ahead of time, they will serve the inhabitants of the land. Again, they arrive as honored guests. Uh, they would leave 400 years later uh, as slaves. Uh, and then the time or the duration is, uh, is mentioned, 400 years. Uh, we'll find out later it's exactly 430 years. And uh, Acts 17 kind of re reiterates that as well. But again, it's the idea of these four generations uh, the nation of the land will be judged by God. And certainly that is the story that we celebrate during Passover when we have the Passover Seder. And we go through the little reading the Haggadah about how God intervened. And, uh, and we, though they cried with tears and cried out to God and so forth, God heard their cries and heard their prayers. And he sends Moses as their deliverer. And then God sends the, the plagues. And we go through all of the different plagues. And of course, that last plague is that uh, the first son born in every household would die unless the blood of the lamb was over the doorpost and then the angel of death would pass over. Uh, happened just as predicted by God. Fifth, the descendants of Abram would emerge with great possessions. And um, that's what happened as well. I mean, uh, Moses instructs the Israelites who are slaves, uh, go to the Egyptians and tell them, uh, can I have your ATM card as long as I'm leaving here today? And uh, they didn't really have ATM cards. Stay with me here. But they asked for gold and silver and clothing, and they give it to them, and, uh, which they promptly use to make this little golden calf. But that's a different story. But they give them their gold and their silver, uh, and they leave as God predicted. And then Abram shall die in peace, be buried at a good old age. That is, he will die of natural causes, uh, the good old age in this fa uh, case was 175 years. So he walks with the Lord for 100 years. But understand what else is happening here. Lord, are you sure we're going to really inherit the land? Yes, we're gonna, I'm going to cut a covenant with you. So you're sure that this is really going to happen. Uh, did I mention one part of this, though? All your descendants first are going to be hauled off to another country and be enslaved for 400 years there. I just thought I would mention that in case it comes up in conversation with somebody. You kind of have a heads up on it. Uh, oh, yeah, and then, of course, that means you're not around 400 years later, uh, but you're good. You're going to die in peace here at a good old age, which means, yeah, and when they come back, then they're going to take the land. So actually, uh, that's a yes on your descendants getting the land. That's a no on you ever actually seeing it yourself. It's kind of like you get the great news. You've just inherited $10 million. All right. Uh, bad news, it's actually given to your great-grandson. Okay, that's, that's kind of good. <laughs> Not quite the same thing, but that's kind of good. And uh, now, what did God already just say to him? I'm your shield and your great reward. Abraham, if you're going to walk with me, it's just going to be us. <laughs> You know, you're just going to have to learn to trust me. And, uh, and of course, Abraham did, known as a friend of God. Uh, very, very interesting. The promises are going to be true, but it's going to be in God's timing, God's purposes, and for his plans. Of course, the descendants, seven, will return after the fourth generation, which they did. And again, that generation and that lifetime was about 100 years. And then eight, to the return to the land would be at a time when the Amorites, again, just a name for one of the major tribes in Canaan, would be at the apex of their wickedness. And we know that when Joshua comes back into the land, he's instructed by God now to carry out this judgment. What is this supposed to tell us about God? He is incredibly compassionate. Now, I thought they got judged. No, he's incredibly compassionate. These guys absolutely deserved it now. Had they heard about the one true God? They all did, they all knew, as people groups do today. People across the world today, almost 93% in what's called their folk religion, the one that goes back to their ancient ancestors, know a couple of things. They all say that there is one God who is the creator, 
And they all have a story of a flood. They all have a story of sin coming into the world through one man and one woman, different names, but the basic story is intact. Not only that, they've had Abraham in the land for a hundred years, building altars and worshiping God. Not only that, they got this guy named Melchizedek, who's the king of Jerusalem, the king of the Most High God. So there are people there that know there's a witness and there's a testimony of how you can know God, and yet they refuse and they turn their back on God. Now, in terms of by the time you get Joshua coming back, uh, a couple of interesting things of, about the people that were at that time. Because he talks about when their sin rises to its fullness. Uh, William F. Albright, who's probably the most noted archaeologist uh, really in history, uh, is, uh, and, and I don't know as a, as a believer or not, but he talks about the fact that the, the, uh, of the Canaanite pantheon of gods, uh, there were three. There was Anath, uh, Asherah, and, uh, and the Asterus, and uh, there's several other names with lots of vowels, but uh, we won't attempt those right now. But uh, he says in studying those, the secular expert, world famous, says that sex was their primary function in these gods and the worship of their gods. That's why when Joshua comes back in the land, God speaking to Moses, writing Leviticus 18, 1 to 24, lists 12 variations of incest that were endemic to the Canaanites, along with adultery, child sacrifice, all kinds of sexual perversion, and concludes with this warning, do not make yourself unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. So when God says, by the time they return, that's going to be about all I can take. Uh, and that, that's what it was. Uh, but what it's supposed to speak to us was God's compassion. Did he judge them 10 years later? No. 20 years later? No. 100 years later? No. Four, 400 years. He waits for them to repent. Uh, they don't. Donald Barnhouse says that if the iniquity of the world had been full 100 years ago, none of us would have been born to be born again. God's pretty patient. And uh, if you're not sure about this, watch the news tonight. Uh, it's, there's, there's just some horrible things that are, that are going on that are being done by people uh, and God's patience waiting for us to uh, turn to him. The fourth thing here is the promise is confirmed by the presence of God that we mentioned here in verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Raphaim, the uh, Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites, and many other sites as well. But uh, all the people that are uh, there... Uh, so again, the covenant confirmed by the presence of God. Uh, uh, biblical writers call this a, a theophany, uh, the presence of God where he comes down in the same way that he appears to Moses at the burning bush. It's the same way that he appears and leads the children of Israel through the wilderness in a, in a pillar of fire. In the same way, when Solomon dedicates the temple and prays to the Lord for wisdom, God comes down in his, again, like a fire or smoke, his Shekinah glory, that's what you have here. Very interesting, the words, a smoking oven and a burning torch. Probably don't get that, that same image with the word smoking oven. I uh, had mentioned in the first service, the last time I saw a, a smoking oven, though, was when Kathy and I were first dating. Uh, we didn't really know each other well. We were over at her mom's house, and it was, uh, we were getting hungry. So decided she put a pizza in the oven, and she put it in upside down. <laughs> we had a smoking oven. But uh, I took it as a good sign. I thought, I'm sure she knows how to do a pizza. This means she's nervous. That means she probably likes me. But uh, so I took it as a good sign. Well, the smoking oven here was a good sign as well. It was the uh, presence of God, uh, this theophany. Uh, again, it's Exodus 19, 18. The Lord descended on Mount Sinai in a fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. And we have similar kind of... Uh, uh, descriptions of God's presence. So God walks through, God seals the deal, uh, but Abraham never does. Secondly, the confirmation of the covenant is given with a description of the land. 
uh, notice it's not only am I going to give you the land, but the land's going to run all the way to the river Euphrates. So actually all of that land in modern day Iraq uh, across Jordan and Syria, that's all Israel's. They just really don't know it yet. Uh, David Hawking, who's Good friend with us uh, many times was being interviewed as, uh, on CNN or Fox, one of the two, when the whole issue of the West Bank was coming up. Again, uh, the heart of Israel that is on the west side of the Jordan, uh, Jordan River, uh, an area given to, the, uh, to Israel uh, through, uh, through the UN and so forth, but an area, quote, of dispute today. Uh, and they were asking him what he thought about the dispute over the West Bank. He said, I'm not really concerned about the West Bank. I'm a little more concerned about the East Bank. And they said, the East Bank, yeah, the land all the way to the Euphrates belongs to Israel. God said it right back here in Genesis. And uh, as he says, they don't usually like to talk to him very long. Uh, <laughs> I kind of wrap up those interviews with David real quick. But uh, that's all of the land that God gives to Israel here. Uh, and then this idea that the, um, they would have uh, the ability to conquer these other nations once they came back into the land. And of course, <clears throat> all of this, again, these two big issues help us re remind us of the fact that uh, we are saved by, by grace alone, that there's nothing that we do. Abraham didn't have to get up and say, well, God, you promised this, then I promise this. I promise I will always worship you. I promise I will always be faithful to you. Did you ever make promises? I grew up, <laughs> I would make promises all the time. Uh, uh, when there's a riptide and I'm on my surfboard and the people on the beach are getting really small, really small. And uh, I would make a lot of promises to God. Uh, surfing's probably great for you spiritually. You know, it's keeping those promises later that's the, the, the big deal. Uh, I remember, uh, I mentioned it before, going to a Promise Keepers event, which was a wonderful time to get together with 50,000 guys and worship the Lord and so forth at the uh, Anaheim Stadium. And in the end, uh, you had all these promises that we would make as Promise Keepers. We're going to be better husbands. We're going to do all this. And we're making all these promises to God. And uh, I thought I'd say, well, there's absolutely not a Calvary Chapel event. <laughs> Because uh, we're kind of hung up on the promises he made to us. But uh, Coach McCartney that started the thing had a Roman Catholic background. They're big on making promises, man, and I'm going to stick to it. But uh, I'd encourage you, don't make a lot of promises to God. Look to the ones that he's made to you and then just trust, trust in those. That's what Abraham was able to do. God, are you going to keep this promise? Man, am I going to keep it? Go out, look at those stars up there. That's what it's going to be like, Abraham, one of those days. Right on, Lord, okay. That's what Abraham says in our vernacular. It wasn't like, okay, that's good, God. I really hope this can, kind of works out. That, that really wasn't his response. When we talk about a faith where God imputes to him perfection or the idea of righteousness. He has a right standing before God. Why? Because he believed the promises made to him. And that's why, again, those writers of the New Testament, Paul and James, both refer back to him. Also, this issue, again, of the Abrahamic covenant. It's still their land. It's their land today, and God will bless those that bless them and curse those that curse them. And that's what's happened throughout history. It's very important how we as a nation deal with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. And uh, uh, because as we do, they will. I appreciate the fact that uh, Pastor Chuck kind of puts his money where his mouth is. And when we're, we're in Israel, once in a while, you can see a, an ambulance go by and on the side of it, donated by Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. You know, as we go up to the uh, baptismal site that all Christians from around the world go to to be baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, most people don't know it, but all paid for by Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Why? I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. And uh, so important to be a, a blessing to the people of Israel because God will keep his word. There's a whole about 80% of Christians that call themselves Christians in the world today that believe that those promises to Israel are now for the church. But uh, that's not what we see here in this passage in Genesis. Paul tells us this about Genesis 15, 6, explaining salvation. He says, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was written for his, not for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but also for us. Paul says, this is for, for us guys. He shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses 
It was raised because of our justification. Paul says this wasn't just written and just said for Abraham. It was written and said for our benefit as well. Again, my issue, my problem sometimes is that I've got God's promises and I've got my present day circumstances and sometimes there's this like big gap and God asks me to fill that gap with faith and trust his, his character. So read a little quote from Joshua Harris. He's a guy that wrote, young guy, wrote, wrote several books. But his kind of first big book was uh, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Don't know if you read that one, but uh, our kids did. <laughs> And uh, seemed to work for them, but uh, uh, very, uh, very smart young man, written several books now. But he says, uh, I knew a girl who used to think that the stars were tiny specks of light just over her head. I'm not kidding. And she wasn't in grade school when she believed this. She was in college. She was really sweet, kind, redhead who spoke almost perfect Spanish. She was intelligent in many ways, but one day in a conversation she mentioned that she had just learned that the stars in the night sky were actually really far away. I asked her what she meant. She said, you know, they're not just like right up there. They're not just tiny dots. They're really far away. I was incredulous. Uh, what did you think they were before? I thought they were, you know, just right, right above us. And he goes on, he says, if you were to ask me why it matters that we study the doctrine of God, I'd say for the same reason it's worth knowing that the stars are not tiny pinpricks of light just above our heads. When we know the truth about God, it fills us with wonder. If we fail to understand his true character, we'll never be amazed by him. We'll never feel small as we stare up at him. We'll never worship him as we ought. We'll never run to him for refuge or realize the great love he's shown in the measureless distance he bridged to rescue us. Because that gap's got to be filled sometimes with a pretty big God. And if you get a real tiny view of him, like those stars, there's little pinpricks up there. No, there are a lot more than that. And so is God. And we need to, we study the doctrine of God so that we'll understand who he is and the great distance he's come to condescend so that he might die on a cross for our sins. That if we place our faith in him, he imputes or gives righteousness to us. That's it. That's the gospel. And Abraham is the guy that becomes the example of it all the way back here in Genesis.